Good evening. Simon Jacobson here for another episode of Wednesday Night Live. Both on location here in New York City as well as online bro global broadcast. Tonight's uh, class is dedicated by our good friend Mark Belinsky in uh, an honor and memory of his uh, grandmother's yard site, Sarah Bat Moshe, on the 10th of Tammuz, the Hebrew month of Tammuz, which we are in now. <clears throat> when uh, we dedicate learning and inspiration and uh, all the resolutions and actions that will come out of, hopefully, from this uh, tonight's discussion in the merit of this soul um, so it's both a merit for the soul and it's a merit for us to be connected into the eternal journey of each of our souls and in our case for many good years souls inside bodies through this uh, through this lifetime of ours so and my usual uh, MO or mission of uh, this type of weekly, weekly class is to focus on um, the relevance, the spiritual and personal, psychological, emotional relevance of Judaism, of Torah thought, Torah ideas. What I usually do is take a weekly chapter in the Torah or a uh, corresponding timely holiday and discuss it in that context of what is its relevance, what kind of message does it offer us in our own contemporary lives the issues that we struggle with, the uh, issues we dealing with. So tonight we will be talking about corruption at the top. Um, and it's interesting, when you read the sequence of the chapters, we're now in the book, the fourth book of the Torah, which is the book of Numbers, or sometimes, or in Hebrew called the book of Bamidbar. <coughs> so just as a short introduction, 52 weeks of the year, for every week there's a corresponding chapter, 52 chapters in the Torah, and for each, and, and for every day in the week, every day is seven days of the week, there's seven sections in each chapter. In effect, every day of the week, every day of the year, has its corresponding section. And using the expression of the Alter Rebbe, Rabbi Shneir Zalman of Liadi, to live with the times, means not just uh, not to live with the New York Times, but uh, there was no New York Times in his time, but to live with something the Jews have been living with for now 3,323 years from the time of Sinai, living with a particular chapter and the section of that chapter corresponding to that particular day. So in that context, we begin the reading of the Torah every year right after the High Holidays, which means the first Bereshis, the first chapter of Genesis is read, right? Simchas Torah, the conclusion of Sukkot on Simchas Torah, and on the Shabbos afterwards, and that begins the cycle every year. So every year, the cycle continues until we reach the end of the year, meaning the last chapter will be read again on some Klistara, um of this coming year. So we're now in the book of Numbers, we're winding, we could say there's another, I mean, I guess there's another, how many weeks? Around 15 weeks to Rosh Hashanah, something like that. So that would be the, the, the continuing chapters of Numbers through De Deuteronomy until the conclusion. So this chapter we're reading is called the chapter of Balak. Referring to Balak was a king, the king of Moabite king, a Mo king of Moab. Moab was an ancient land, basically modern day uh, Jordan approximately. And as the Jews are finishing their travels, the 40 years of wandering in the wilderness in the Sinai desert. So they're now coming close to the river Jordan. As last week's chapter said, the Jews traveled and uh, camped in the plains of, of Moab across the Jordan near Jericho. So basically, if you know the map today, the map Jericho of today is the same Jericho of old. Jericho somewhat east of Jerusalem, a little northeast of Jerusalem, not far from the Jordan River and the Jordanian border. So Moab was on the, basically the east bank of the Jordan River, essentially east of Jerusalem. Uh, so that's where the Jews had arrived, and they were. this was one of the last journeys. They would be concluding their journeys there. And uh, as we know, at the end of the Torah, Moses actually dies and is buried in that area, a place we do not know till this day. And then Joshua would be the one that would cross the River Jordan, and they would actually enter into the Promised Land. So 
more or less the Jews are coming to the, as I said, the final steps of their journey. And then here, and, and in this context, in this area, begins the chapter, the story, the episode of this week's Pasha. And the Pasha begins that Bullock, as I said, the name of the chapter, Bullock, Bullock ben Sipper, he um, was the king of Moab, and he saw the, the chapter begins, he witnessed everything that, the, that happened to the Jewish people from the time they had left Egypt. Because you have to remember that all the nations that lived in Israel and around Israel were all aware of the Egyptian exodus. And they were all aware that the Jews were marching through the wilderness and actually terrified them because they didn't know what the Jews would be doing. So he comes up with a ruse. I'm just telling the story the way the Torah tells it before we get into the lessons and messages. So basically Moab, I'm sorry, Balak, uh, being frightened that the Jews would conquer his land and, over, and overcome his people, so he turns to the elders of Midian, which was a neighboring country. Remember, Midian is the place where uh, jo J J Moses escapes to and actually marries Sipporah, who comes from Midian. It's interesting that Bullock is Ben Sipper. Sipper is a bird, actually. Um, and Sipporah is uh, the female version. So, uh, so jo J Moses in Midian, Yisra, Jethro, is a prince of Midian. So Midian is a neighboring city, uh, to Mo a neighboring country to Moab. So, um, so Balak turns to the elders of Midian and says, this community of Jews is now going to gnaw away everything around us. Just as an ox in the field that eats up all the vegetation. Basically seeing the march of the Jews, and they had marched all the way till here, so he was concerned that they would, they would conquer his land. So what does he do? Um, they, they come up with a plot. They send messengers to a famous uh, sorcerer of the time. His name is Balaam, or Balaam. And Balaam was a, a, actually a legitimate and authentic uh, prophet. As a matter of fact, in the Torah it says that there was no prophet that rose in Israel as Moses. So the Medrash says in Israel there was no prophet like Moses. But outside of Israel, meaning outside of the Jewish people, there was. And Balaam was that prophet. So basically Balaam was uh, next to Moses was the second greatest prophet of that time. So that's a pretty great tribute. So Bullock wisely turns to him. And they send messengers to him to, to, that to he should come and curse these, Jewish, these Jews. And there was, I'll read, I'll, I'm just reading the translation here. He says, look, a nation has come out of Egypt. Look, it has covered the eye of the land. Meaning that they were like large numbers. So now please come and curse these people for me. For they are more powerful than us. If you curse them, perhaps we will then be able to strike at them and drive them out of the land. And Balak basically gives uh, Balaam that vote of confidence, for I know that whoever you bless is blessed, and whoever you curse is cursed. Meaning that Balaam had that power, which he did. Anyway, so they, the, 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 ch the chapter continues that the elders of Moab and the elders of Midian went with the tools of black magic in their hands, and uh, they came to Balaam and told him this message, the messengers. And Balaam responded to them, Stay here overnight, I will give you an answer when God speaks to me. Being that he was actually a legitimate uh, prophet and a legitimate sorcerer as well. So he knew that he needed to have God's power. God came to Balaam, the Torah continues, and says, Who are these men with you? And Balaam responds, Balak, the son of Sippur, the king of Moab, has sent them to me with a message that they would like, us, like me to curse them. And God responds, Don't go with them. Don't curse the nation. Because they are a blessed nation. When Balaam got up in the morning, he basically told those messengers there's no way he can go because he cannot say anything that God does not tell him to say. So go back to your country, for God has refused to let me go with you. When they returned to Bullock and they told him that Balaam refused to come, Bullock sends another higher level dignitaries, higher in rank than the previous ones. And they came to Balaam and they made even a sweeter offer. They said, Bullock is saying this time, do not refrain from coming from you. I will give you tremendous honor. And whatever you tell me to do, I will do. And Balaam, rep Balaam replies, even if Bullock were to give me his house full of silver and gold, I cannot transgress the word of God. 
But here again, because Balaam was actually interested in cursing the Jews, he had no good intentions. So he told him again, stay overnight, and let's see what happens. And this time God says to him, um, this time go with them, but only say what I tell you to say. So I'm going to stop right here, the actual reading. I'll just tell you what happens afterwards. So here we have the, subsequently the story that I discussed a few years ago at length. If any of you are interested in the story with the speaking donkey. You know, the plot thickens here, it gets quite exciting. Any of you ever met a donkey that speaks? Well, there are people that, that, are, that speak that are like donkeys. Um, the Zohar actually says that one of the reasons this miracle happened was to teach us that in case somebody gets ever up and, and, and is very arrogant and uh, pompous in their, in their oratory uh, skills or lecturing others, they should know that even a donkey once spoke. So don't get too excited about the fact that someone can speak. So the continuing story is that Bilam begins the journey. An angel comes and stands in the way that only the, his donkey is able to see. And ultimately, uh, God opens up the donkey's mouth to tell, but Balaam strikes the donkey for not wanting to travel forward. And finally, the donkey speaks to Balaam and tells him, I have been loyal to you. And that's when Balaam discovers that the angel stopped him from trying to travel on. Now, this I'm not going to address this part of the story, even though it may be the most, uh, I guess, the raciest uh, part. Um, because I, I did discuss it in the past. It's just part of the episode here, so I just wanted to share that. The bottom line is, Balaam finally does come to uh, Balak, tells Balak to prepare different offerings, and he would be ready to start cursing them. But remember, God had made the condition, only say what I tell you to say. So Balaam opens his mouth the first time, and instead of curses, blessings come out of his mouth. Balak, of course, is furious because he paid him to curse them. He didn't pay him to bless them. So Balaam says, let's go to another location, let's bring different offerings. This happens three times, and each time the blessings that come out of Balaam are even greater than the previous blessings. To the point that the blessings that Balaam blessed the Jews at that point become prayers that we say every day. Matovu, that we say every morning, for example, when we say how beautiful are the tents of, 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 of Israel. Alecha Yaakov, of Jacob, rather. Mishkanesachi Yisrael, and the encampments of Israel. These are Balaam's blessings. And Balaam not only blessed that, Balaam is the first one that begins to allude to the coming of Mashiach even. So even the Messiah is alluded to in his blessings. And they're very, very powerful blessings. So obviously this itself is a great lesson, how you turn liability into assets and curses into blessings. We'll talk about that as well. But that's the, end of the, that's the story. And of course, the whole plot of Balak and his people uh, was overturned. But the interesting thing is, what's so fascinating, that the Jews were never going to overrun or kill or, take, or conquer mob. They were going to Israel. So the whole thing was based on a false premise and paranoia of, uh, of uh, Balak. As a matter of fact, Ruth would come from Moab, and, Moab and, and, the, and God had told the Jews that they should not attack Moab, because uh, Moab came from one of the children of Lot, Lot, who had children with his, with his daughters, so Moab was one of them. And Moab would be the root, would be the ancestor of Ruth, who would later become the grandmother of Jacob, of the, I'm sorry, David, King David, and actually the grandmother of Mashiach, because Messiah comes from the house of David. So, the whole episode here that was really, instead of, it, uh, first of all, Balak had nothing to fear, and instead of turning into curses, as I said, the whole thing turned into major blessings. However, things are not so, the, the ending is not so happy. The end of the chapter, Balaam was no fool. He knew and he realized that he could only say what God tells him to say. Which is interesting, even a sorcerer, even a wicked sorcerer, even a person who was uh, very not interested in the welfare of the Jews, he knew that he can't say anything that God doesn't tell him to say. And since God wanted to bless the Jews, there was nothing he could do. Even if he didn't like it, what came out of his mouth were the blessings. But he gives Balak a piece of advice at the end of the chapter, and he says, you cannot attack these Jews through curses, because they, God, they, they have God... God, they, they, are, they find favor in God's eyes. If you want to attack them, you have to get them to self-destruct. And he says, he suggests a very simple suggestion. He says, send the Midianite women who are very beautiful to seduce the Jewish men, the Israelites, and they will do that and they will desecrate and they'll defile and they will also 
uh, worship besides uh, besides the sexual transgressions, also worship by idolatry, then they will become vulnerable, and that's when you'll be able to attack them. And that's exactly what happens. Which, of course, is the lesson here as well, that no one can attack us unless we ourselves allow ourselves to become vulnerable. But to go to the theme that I want to address, there's this interesting sequence here. If you look at the theme of the chapters up till here, there's a certain common denominator between all of them. Um, if you recall, a few weeks back we read, four weeks ago, we read the chapter of Shlach, when Moses sends the spies, the scouts, to spy, the, scout, the spies to scout out the land of Israel in preparation to conquer it. So these were also leaders. They were the leaders of the tribes. They were the best cream of the crop. And uh, when Moses sent them, they were kosher and they were holy people. They were great people. But then they fall. They come back with this terrible report. And as a result, they incite the entire people. As the Torah puts it, they slander the land of Israel. And they say, we cannot enter this promised land. And that night becomes a tragic night with the entire people, except for two people, or three. Moses, of course, but also Kolov and Yeshua, everyone rebels against God's promise. And this becomes the first Tishabov, the first and most uh, the saddest, uh, the saddest events of the most tragic, the saddest day of the Jewish calendar. The first of those sad events before the destruction of the temple was the night when the scouts incited and slandered Israel. And as a result, God decreed. Your self-fulfilling prophecy, you don't want to go into the land of Israel? Okay, none of you will ever enter. As a result, everybody would die in the wilderness, except Kalav and Yeshua, the two people who defended the promise and defended and said we could conquer this uh, beautiful land. So that's episode one. The chapter after that, another leader rises in mutiny. Korach. Korach too was a leader. He was a Levite. He was Pikachoyo, he was very wise. He was wealthy. He was uh, J Moses' cousin and a leader. And he rose with another argument against Moses and Aaron. Why did you take the leadership for yourself? And that too ends up in tragedy, where Korach and his four, 250 men that he gathered um, all end up being killed. The story with the earth coming, consuming its inhabitants. The earth swallows them up. And here again, a chapter later, well, with the chapter in between Chukas, which is often read together with Balog, this year it's read separately because it's a leap year, comes another chapter of leadership. And this time it's Balak, king of Moab, and Bilam, the great Bilam, the great prophet. And they too come and uh, attack the Jewish people. So there's an interesting common denominator in these chapters, the story of the scouts, the story of Korach, and now the story of the Balak and Bilam show, that um, essentially all have one common denominator, how leadership gets corrupt. And different types of leaders, each one of course has their own particular story. So it's interesting to focus on this and see what it means in our own lives. Let's apply it for a moment in our own uh, situation. You know, um, the, the famous saying goes that um, power corrupts. And absolute power corrupts absolutely. Because when a person has power and there's no checks and balances, no accountability, it uh, gets to your head and uh, you can become arrogant and, uh, and therefore become uh, corrupt, uh, become, uh, become um, crooked. And you start justifying whatever you want to do because you don't answer to anyone. And the power intoxicates the person to thinking that they're invulnerable. Some people even think they're incorruptible, even though as corrupt as they get, because there's no one to uh, challenge them. And you see this throughout history. You know, even in the modern day, so to speak, you know, we just come from July 4th, and we celebrate Independence Day. What is it, 200 and uh, um, 1776? 235. 235 years ago, Declaration of Independence which was an enduring document that led to the Constitution of the United States, which essentially was the first document 
of its sort that um, institutionalized the concept of freedom of rights. The rights that each, inalienable rights that each of us have. Which, if you think about it in context of history, is quite a historical event, a watershed moment, paradigm shift. Because up to that point, King George in England was, of course, the ones they were rebelling against. He was leaving and taxing the people here in the United States. And that's where they essentially declare independence from him. He was one example of the thousands of years of history ruled by monarchs or other types of leaders who uh, completely controlled the monopoly, dictatorship, mostly, and, we were, and all the people were at their mercy. This were the, whether they were monarchs or despots or whatever you want to call them. Some of them perhaps were benevolent, but that was due to the, just the fluke, meaning it was they were benevolent. If we were lucky, they were benevolent, but if they weren't, they terrorized the people. And there was no checks and balances. There was no concept of, equal, uh, of equality. The monarch, a king, was seen as closer to God. Definitely church leaders, religious leaders, were seen as more powerful than the rest. And this was the common fact. So obviously there was a lot of corruption when you have power concentrated by so few. This is the story of the French Revolution, the American Revolution, and then later the Russian Revolution. The Tsars against the Tsars. These are all revolutions that rebelled against the idea of a type of singular power that one family or one group or one individual um, yielded, wielded rather. And, uh, and even today, you have a simpler monarchy in Saudi Arabia. So if there was no oil there, there was no money, obviously they probably would be, they wouldn't have such type of monopoly. So people throughout history, whoever came to power, um, justified the reason that they felt that they had to have absolute power. And absolute power is always the potential for absolute corruption. Now, the real question that many of us ask is, did democracy and freedom change that? You know, do we have less corruption today, let's say a country like the United States? It's true that there's no leader that has lifetime uh, tenure. You know, a president has four years and has to be reelected. The same thing other elected officials. So even if someone is completely corrupt, no one can just last forever. But the question is, if everybody's corrupt, so who cares? You, you keep electing every four years another corrupt individual. Now, I know it sounds a little sacrilegious to some other presidents are corrupt. You know, there are the cynics that say that uh, the power is corrupting, and as soon as you get to Washington, you know, it may not be in the same sense where they go ahead and they massacre a uh, million people, 10 million people like Stalin or Hitler or others did. But in, a, in other ways, financial and others, there's a certain manipulation that takes place at the top. And there is a lot of corruption. And remember, at the end of the day, there are elected officials, but there are officials that are not elected, and in some ways are even more powerful than the ones we know about. Because they just are, they're always there. So, the, the, I don't know the cynics, but they're the so-called conspiracy theorists claim that all power is corrupting, the people who have money are constantly conspiring with their money how to keep their money and make more money which on the backs of everybody else. So the wealthy, the, the, the wealthy get wealthier and the poor get poorer. And they maintain a certain type of so-called checks and balances just to make sure that the matrix and the illusion is held up, that no, not, there isn't some mass rebellion. And there are people that argue that it's much worse today than it was in, Zara, in the time of the czars or the monarchs because today it masquerades in the veil of justice, and we have lawyers, and you can sue, and stuff like that. But if you really get to cut to the cut to root, through it, some say the whole thing is one big corrupt system that has some rules and regulations that make sense, but ultimately who wins is the ones who know how to manipulate the rules. The ones who know how to have staying power. You know, if you have enough money, you can litigate and, uh, and kill anyone. It's nothing to do with justice. The one with the most money will ultimately prevail. With rare exceptions, once in a while, there's a celebration of, of, of a so-called underdog that wins, but it's not necessarily the rule. So I'm not getting into now debate, I'm just throwing out the different theories on the matter. Even those of us that are, let's call it more idealistic, or some would say more naive, um, would say, yes, there is corruption, but there's also certain rules, and you know, it's the best we have, Churchill said, that the capitalism or democracy is the worst system he ever discovered, but never found a better one. So under the circumstances with human beings, 
And if you go to Marx, who claimed that uh, any type of personal gain, or rather personal profit, and private uh, property ultimately will create haves and have-nots, and ultimately we create alienation and the division of the classes. And his argument was we should have one big pot where everybody gets according to their needs and contributes according to their abilities. So theoretically, it may have made sense in his time, and that's why it was so attractive to many intellectuals, because it sounded good on paper, it was utopian. But it didn't work. As a matter of fact, some argue that under Marxism, or later it's, a, it's a, or it's a, or it's, I don't know if you call it a bastard child, or it's evolved child called communism, all forms of it, there was more abuse of individual power than all the capitalism put together. Look at, people, look at the dictators that lived in this, like a guy like Stalin. In the name of what's good for the masses. So Marxism may have been, on paper, made sound great, but the bottom line is it was not viable, it didn't work. And you had more abuse of individual power than the monarchs before that it was trying to displace and, and capitalism. So capitalism, yes, is driven by greed. It's driven by per personal gain, which in capitalism is seen as a motivation and incentive for people to produce, for people to innovate, let them make money, but it makes a better world. And then we need checks and balances, which aren't perfect, but of course the argument against it, we just saw in the last the decade or two, how the checks and balances not only are not perfect, completely collapsed. And uh, if it wasn't for us continuing to maintain the illusion that America can't go bankrupt, because then who knows what would happen, you know, um, who do you trust? Who can you trust? Is there anyone on top that we trust? Is anyone here we trust a, a, a CEO, uh, the head of any, depart of any, of any company? You know, with, um, I was reading in the New York Times a few weeks ago, a few months ago, there was an article, the, great, the largest corporation in the United States is General Electric, and they have, their largest department is a tax department. It has something like 900 employees, and their job is simply one thing and one thing only, to find tax breaks. So 900 people are hired, and they're able to pull off equivalent, I think something like 2 or $3.4 billion a year that they save taxes. So, of course, three, four, four, four billion dollars is, is, is worth to have a department of 900 people working just on that. And they do it legally. Who do they hire? They hire former IRS directors. They hire tax experts. They hire tax attorneys. The best that worked in the government. Like they say, the, the, who, who, who manufactures radar detectors? The people who manufacture radars. And then they manufacture better radar in order to... to uh, counter the radar detector, and then they develop a better radar detector. So it's a, it's a great business because you're always winning. You're, you're, you're both providing the cat and the mouse. You know, that's the best the type of business, right? So I'm not trying to be overly cynical, but it's not, this is not so far-fetched. If you're running a good business, you know, it is about loopholes. Remember, um, the fear of God is not what keeps people in line. It's the fear of being caught, the deterrence. So if you're wise enough, or if you can find the legal loopholes. I mean, the tax code is so damn complicated. It's impossible that there shouldn't be loopholes everywhere. So it's just a matter of finding the right ones, then you close them, then there's new ones. And the, and the game goes on. So in that context, you know, it, it becomes, it's almost like an inevitability that there will be corruption. How, to what extent? We will never know because good people know how to cover it up. So it's impossible to even uh, identify. But what we see in these weeks is we see it's nothing new. This goes back all the way back to the biblical times, even great people. Even great people. You could talk about Bullock and Bilaam in this week's chapter. You can say, okay, they were cruel people, they were anti Semites, they hated the Jews. But the Miraglim, the scouts, were Tzadikim. They were righteous people. They were the leaders of the tribes. They were handpicked by Moses. Korach was a very uh, powerful person, spiritually considered a great person. They say about the, the, the uh, who is it that said it, the Shpolazay, the Helik Rizhner. They said, he used to say about this, Kairach, the Helik is the Kairach, my holy grandfather Kairach, because he was a Levite. So, you see, he was a great man, and yet the Torah documents their corruption as well. So it's interesting, not just interesting, it's, I think, fascinating that we can glean lessons from this. But I want to bring it back now to the personal. You know, this is on the political level, economic, uh, global. What about us as individuals? 
us as individuals. So we too, are we corruptible? Um, it's a rhetorical question, you don't have to volunteer your thoughts. Um, I'll just share the following. Obvi obviously we're all corruptible, there's no question about it. Some say the price, everybody's got a price, everybody for the right price can be bought. None of us would like to admit it, none of us would like to believe it, but that's what they say. And you wonder, yeah, the price is high enough. And the Torah actually says it in another verse that we'll read later in the summer, closer in the month of Elul. It says, Sheikhid Ya'aver Ene Chachamim, Musalev Divrei Tzadikim. Sheikhid, which is the Hebrew word for uh, bribery, or broader, you can say it's bias. Sheikhid Ya'aver blinds the eyes of the wise, and it distorts Divrei, the words of Tzadikim. As I've discussed many times, how does the Torah call them Chachamim, wise and tzaddikim? You know, when the Torah calls somebody a Chacham, a wise person, a tzaddik, a righteous person, it's not a cliche, it means that the person is actually wise. Because that's precisely what the Torah is trying to point out. That if bias or bribery can um, blind the eyes of the fool, that's not a big achievement. The person is a fool in the first place. The power of bias and bribery is such that even someone who's truly wise, the Torah des designates as wise, even such a person can be blinded. And even a tzaddik, words can be distorted. So we all have ability through bias, through some type of self-interest, to have distortions, intentionally or unintentionally. Moses recuses himself from stating anything about his brother Aaron, even though he was a man of God and knew how to be selfless, but inevitably... It's your brother, your blood relative, you must recuse yourself. And this is the basis of, of modern law as well, that a judge or, uh, or anyone in the legal profession will recuse himself if self-interest is involved. Even if there's no direct, uh, obvious evidence that self-interest will affect you, but even appearance that it may affect you. Or, or it may affect you in ways you may not even notice, you just recuse yourself. So clearly, every, every person has a line that we are blinded, we are, not, we are not totally objective. I'm not even getting again to malicious, intentional, even not malicious, not intentional. There's certain natural biases we have, whether it's to family members, whether it's to someone we have, uh, we're in business with, or, an in, or some subject matter that we have an interest that this one person should win or lose. And then there's the expression in the Talmud, Kola Godl Mechavere Yitzrei Godl Mimenu. The greater the person, the greater the Yetzirah. Because we see great people. Great people, every person that has great strengths, strengths can be used in two different directions. When someone is not that smart, so then if they lie or if they distort something, it won't be that type of, it won't be that uh, innovative. The smarter the person, the more innovative they are. You meet someone who's really brilliant, when they want to be uh, corrupt, when they are corrupt, the way they cover their tracks, it's almost impossible to trace it because they're so smart. So the mind, which is in a sense what makes us human beings, should make us human beings be objective, where we don't just succumb to our impulses or to our emotional needs. The mind itself, should it become distorted, can be much more dangerous than emotional distortion. And in Tanya, actually, in the book of Tanya, he actually puts it in a very interesting way. Chapter 9, he says the following. It says that we all have two souls within us. The animal soul and the divine soul. We call the nefesh al kis and nefesh abamis. Sometimes it's called yetzer toiv yetzer hara. I mean the real name nefesh abam, the full soul is the animal soul, the divine soul. Part of that is the yetzer tov, which is the emotional side of the animal soul, is called the yetzer hara. The emotional side of the, of the divine soul is called the yetzer tov, the, the, the good inclination. And he continues and says, the, animal, the divine soul rests in the mind. And the animal soul rests in the heart. And he explains, because the heart, which is emotions, is controlled by impulse. The animal soul works by impulse. You want something, you see something, you want it now. You, don't, you desire something, you uh, have a, a lust or pleasure in something, you don't reflect. The mind is a reflective instrument. So if we were working at our best, your heart may tell you, I want this, 
You know, you may see something, you may be attracted to something, you may be fantasized about something. But in a healthy situation, your reflective mind will say, you know what, you have to check. You're not a two-year-old. A good mind stops you from thinking, is this healthy? This is the right thing for me. What are the long-term consequences? That's in a normal situation. However, this is what he says. Just like the blood from the heart rushes to the brain and gives it, uh, gives it uh, sustenance, you know, the brain needs blood as well, so too the emotions of the heart can rush to the brain and distort the mind. So if the mind is working on its, in a, it, at its strength, then it would be reflective and would not let the heart control it. It would listen to the heart. You know, sometimes you're in a dangerous situation and your heart starts pounding and telling you you're in danger. The mind listens and you run. But there are many situations someone offers you something, a candy, just as a small stupid example. So you tell your child, don't just take a candy, you have to know what's inside the candy, even though it may be appealing. You're basically telling your child, use your reflective mind to check and balance your emotions. So even though it may be very desirable, it may be very appealing, very seductive, check it. But what happens if the emotion takes control of the mind? So he says there in Tanya, that can also happen. So it's not just that your subjective heart is telling you you want it. It also travels to the brain and then takes your brain hostage. And now your mind is working overtime to justify the impulses of your heart. That's where it gets troublesome. You know, if we were able to have that type of compartmentalization, my heart is telling me this, and your mind is functioning at strength and saying, you know what, I have to weigh the pros and cons, we would be, 99% of our problems would be gone in our lives. The problem is, the heart immediately takes control of your brain. And your brain starts working and saying, you know, it's not so bad, maybe it is good. When in truth, it's about your self-interest. Your heart's telling you you want it, you desire something, and you're now justifying it with your mind. And that's where it gets troublesome because you can't even know. You convince yourself that your mind is uh, reflected on it and you want it. When in truth, your mind is simply a tool now of your heart. So he goes on in Tanya later explaining how one checks that through uh, self-control and so on and so forth through objective advice, asking a third party because sometimes you don't know. I mean, every one of us has been in situations where you really convince yourself this is right, emotionally and intellectually, and if you're a smart person, you go to a third party, or to another second party rather, a third party meaning behind your mind and your heart, and you ask that person, what do you think? And I, I, I speak for myself to say that often you don't want to really hear another opinion. You want that person to agree. But if you're really an honest person and have integrity, you're going to listen. A person says, no, I think it's wrong. I think you know you're subjective. It's one of the hardest things in life is to, to be able to listen under those circumstances because it's not just your heart is telling you. Your mind is also now convinced. This is what he says there. So, so how does this apply to this whole issue? So obviously, this is called corruption in one way or other. This is where we lose sight of what is right. And the smarter you are, suddenly your brains and your strengths become your liabilities. So when a small person, someone who doesn't have great strengths, makes a mistake, the mistake is a small mistake usually. When a great person makes a mistake, it's usually a big one. You know, when you look at the demonic power of a man like Hitler, no question, had power. You can call it the satanic power of charisma that he had. You see what he was able to do, the frenzy that he was able to build up in millions of people. Manipulative, you can dismiss it any way you like, but he had power in the worst possible way. He was able to convince people to participate, not only participate, to perpetrate murder of innocent people. That's pretty big power. You know, it's one thing to motivate people to do good things. That also takes charisma. But to do terrible things takes even more power. So clearly, power, as I said, goes both ways. Goes both ways. And when it's used the wrong way, it is most destructive of all. So in all these three episodes that we're addressing, this episode of the scouts, the episode of Korach, and now the episode of Bolak and Bilam, you see a great leaders of what happens to them when they begin to uh, tamper with their power, where they lose sight, objective sight. In all three instances, interestingly, thing that was missing was God. 
Because you see, when you reach the top and you're a leader, what's above you? It's one thing when you have a superior to answer to, so you have an accountability, or you're accountable to someone that's elected you. But once you reach a point where you are the superior, so there's an interesting expression about the kings in Israel. It says, Ain't a love el Hashem el Akov. It's like a double expression. It means he reached such height that there's nothing above him except God. Now what happens if there's no God above? And you're at the top. There's no one to look up to. You know, it says in the Talmud, interesting thing, about Pharaoh and the Egyptians. It says, that since rain does not fall in Egypt, they never look up to heaven to God to pray for rain. They look down to the Nile, which irrigates, which rises and the tides of the Nile, whereas in Israel or other places of the world, we look up to heaven to wait for the rain. Now this isn't just symbolic, it also means that you look up, Pharaoh saw himself as a god. As he says to Moses, and he says, I created myself, I'm self-made. Which is really the trap of every great person. There comes a point when you reach success, and power, that you start attributing it to yourself. And it even begins innocently. Why shouldn't you take credit if you really innovated something, you did something great? So the Torah warns us later, do not say when you're successful, that my own power, my own strength created this success. Always know that even if you, put, even if you did work hard, and even if you, it was your part of it, there's still a partner called God. So besides all the religious and theological and logical and scientific arguments for God, if nothing else, the need for God is to check a person who has great power. Because without a God, who's, who, who, where will there be humility? And you'll see the greatest people in history, the ones that really were great, understood that. And they, 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 they built it into their own system. Abraham was a great man. He answered to no one. He was wealthy, found God. He could have built a whole empire just for himself. Instead, he recognized the power of uh, what happens when you reach the top. And he recognized, therefore, the humility. You will see all great people in the Torah. Here, what do you need more than this? When Jacob comes out and is saved from, uh, after 20 years, Laban living by Laban in the most harsh circumstances, builds a family. So he says the classic words, he prays to God and says, I have become small due to all the chesed that you've done with me. This is the sign of the greatest people in, in history. These are the people that endure and live on forever. All those that could not make that statement died and left nothing after them. That's why I always mention here, for example, you, we had great... Leaders in history, great philosophers, maybe no greater philosopher than Aristotle. And his teachings on endure and until this day impact may, maybe more ways, in more than any other person, government thinking and political thinking and economics, logic and so on. But there's no family he's left. There are no children. There are no grandchildren. There's no legacy. There are ideas. And there's no question in my mind that all the greats all these empires that all are over the face of the earth when they once dominated is because they all lacked the ability that when they went to the top, they could not make the statement, we're humble because of all the chesed that we have. I would love anyone to find one example of someone that had that feeling and died. They, no one that had that feeling died. Everybody lived on. I don't mean died physically. I mean their, their lives lived on. The Roman Empire... The Babylonian, they all came, the pinnacle was their arrogance because they thought they're indestructible. And then what happened was, could have been an act of nature, a volcano, or a war, or infighting. Somewhere, the corruption, something happened that undermined their power. Because it's a simple rule, nothing in this material world, no matter how big it is, is forever. Foreverness comes only from the sense of humility. The expression is, bittle cannot become bottle. When you have that type of selflessness, you can't disappear because you're, dis because, you're in because you're invisible in the first place. It's when you become too visible to the point of seeming to be invulnerable, that's when you ultimately have to fall. Everything in this world erodes, ages, and dies. It is only that connection. So if you want an argument for God that is a very practical one, not even going into, as I said, theological arguments or scientific ones, it's simply that. Without that, 
to, how, how can we ever really guarantee um, um, uh, honesty, integrity? Someone reaches the top, why should they answer to anyone? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So the three different episodes, the story plays itself out in different ways, which I'll address. But you see the common denominator. What was the story with the scouts? Scouts, they were told, go to sea, check out the land. What was their crime? They came back and gave a bad report. Weren't they told to come, come give a report? No, but the mistake was, as I've often talked about, they were asked how to conquer the land, not whether. They started playing God. They were smart. They were leaders, and there's no question when they went, they went with good intention. But when they suddenly saw the big giants, they saw the power of the land, they saw materialism, their own spirituality felt threatened. And for good reasons, they said it's a land that consumes its inhabitants. And here's where they forsake God. In their holiness, they made the mistake. Remember, they were not afraid to go in the promised land because of any, because they, they, something in the wilderness was, it was speaking to the Yetzirah. It wasn't for selfish reasons, it was for spiritual reasons. They said materialism is a land that consumes its inhabitants. Why do we want to have to enter into Wall Street, into the marketplace and all the corruption out there? Precisely what they wanted to prevent was corruption. And that's but when they started playing God, because no one asked them that question. The same argument could be made in that case, that we should all decide to leave this earth because this earth is too difficult to live in. You know, soul in heaven doesn't have all the challenges of life. But God sent us to this earth. That was not asked of us. The question that's asked of us is how are you going to sublimate and transform this world into a spiritual place? Not whether it can be done. So they forgot God for a moment. And interestingly, in the name of God, they forgot God. In the name of God became how they understood what God wants. You know? So it's like the person that says, uh, Noah had a similar thing. After, he didn't want to go into the ark. He wanted to remain on land and didn't want to escape into the ark. But then God said, you have to enter the ark. After 40 days and 40 nights of a, of a flood, he didn't want to leave the ark. Because he saw how corrupt the world had become. He was now in the protection of the yeshiva, of the base medrash, of the kolo. He was inside of a womb. Why would he want to leave? So God has to command, say minateva, leave the ark. There's a time, yes, when we need to reinforce ourselves. Nine months each of us spent in our mother's womb. But then there comes the dictate from God, now it's time to leave. Now you're going to go into a world where it's not going to be as easy. None of us are comfortable leaving home for the first time. But it's that going out to the world that may be dangerous, and is dangerous, is where we become adults and we learn to conquer the world. That's the, the mission. So to say we can't do it, that's playing God. So the first mistake, there's their leadership and their philosophical and spiritual powers misled them into becoming biased, convincing themselves that, no, God wants us to stay here. Basically challenging God's ability to give us the power to enter a material world and conquer it. So that was their so-called corruption. That you could say is the subtlest of all the three, because it was with the good intentions. The intentions were to remain in the holiness surrounded by the clouds of glory, surrounded by God's protection, and so on, and not having to deal with material challenges. Korach was the number two episode, and he went the other direction. He said, you know, everybody's holy. We live in this world, everything is godly. What do we need leaders for altogether? So he was going the opposite direction. After hearing what the scouts, that the scouts were wrong, he said, we have to go into the material world, but we don't need any uh, type of spiritual direction from anyone. Everybody can just follow their own instincts and impulses. In a way he was very Marxist as I once discussed here because he challenged the class system. You don't need leaders. You don't need classes. Everybody is holy. What was his mistake? His mistake was, as Marx later, was without leadership you don't have direction and without direction you don't have selflessness. Let everybody free for all then we have the corruption the other, way, other direction. So the scouts felt the best thing is to stay in a spiritual environment. Korach said, let's enter the material world and everybody can figure it out on their own. No, you need to have a, a balance of spiritual direction and spiritual leaders like Moses that can show the way and be an example of what it means to be egoless. Korach, with his 
intentions, ended up becoming an arrogant leader himself and corrupted the, the, became corrupt in the same way. And what is his end and his people's end? The opposite. It says the land that they said the land, the, 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 the scouts said the land that consumes its inhabitants. That's exactly what happened to Korach and his people. The land actually consumed them. It swallowed them up. Because if you immerse into the material world, you know, basically to think of it this way, the scouts wanted to have Shabbos seven days a week. Korach wanted to have weekday seven days a week. And you need a balance of both. The Meraglim, the scouts wanted to have constant sanctity. They don't want to enter into a material world. Korach went the other extreme. He said, okay, the purpose is to transform this material world. What do we need Shabbos for? Why do we need a special day? That's why he asked Korach, he asked Moses those two famous questions. He asked Moses, he was being cute, he said to Moses, you know, you say we put up a mezuzah on the door. What happens if the house is filled with svarim, with holy books? Does it need a mezuzah? What was his point? His point was saying is a mezuzah is just a few, a few verses from the Torah. You have a house full of books with millions of verses, thousands of verses. Why would you need a mezuzah? And then the same question he asked if a talus, the prayer shawl, is completely blue, does it need chelis? In those days, tzitzis had one strand that was blue. If the whole talus is blue, why do you need one strand? In other words, he was basically make, making the point that you don't need to have that type of uniqueness. Everything is holy. The whole house is full of books. What he was lacking was the humility the other direction, that you need a Shabbos, you need a leader, you need a spiritual awakening, you need a mezuzah, you need a strand that, that reminds you that even though, yes, the purpose is to live in this material world, but you have to remember there's a, the, the, it's only a means to reach a spiritual end. And Korach was forgetting about that spiritual end. So there you have a leadership that goes the other direction. You know, um, let's see if we can find an example. If Korach is like Marx, who would the Miraglim be like, the scouts? I'm not sure. Well, definitely not capitalism because they didn't want to go into the material world. They're basically spiritual. They were like ascetics. Ascetic lifestyle. The Scots were like ascetic. Uh, Korach was like complete materialism, no God at all, no holiness, no leadership. And then came Bullock and Bilam. I don't know what you mean, but uh, it sounds nice. Uh, You mean the students of, of Rabbi Akiva? Yeah. I wouldn't go there right now. That's a different uh, subject. So then comes um, the third story in this week's chapter. So here we have Bilam, who's a prophet. Now he, obviously, is a different leader of a different sort because Korach and the Miraglim, number one, they were both leaders among the Jews. Bilam is already a, an outsider, so to speak. And you have Bullock, who's the king. Kings, no matter who they are, as the Talmud says, every king is designated by God. Even the cruel kings in history, it says, Yad Yad Melochim Vesarim Biyad Hashem. I'm sorry, Melochim Biyad Hashem, yeah. I forgot the exact expression, but it's an expression of verse that says that the appointment of kings and leaders is in the hands of God. So even Bullock is a leader. And of course, Bilam, as I said, is a man of God. Yeah, but here was a whole no another story. You know, this story, as it plays itself out in our lives, uh, as I said, the first two is the ascetic life. person decides they want to remain ascetic. The second is the opposite, the immersion. The, the Bilam in each of our lives, we all have a Bilam. We all have, I guess, a sorcerer. How do you like that? You have a sorcerer within. <laughs> um, this is already a whole different level. This is... First of all, much more uh, devious and mischievous. You see, Korach and Miraglim, even though they made fundamental mistakes, but they were philosophical. They had good intentions in mind. It says about Korach, for example, that Korach did see was right, but he was not right then. He was talking about Mashiach's times. In Mashiach's times, we don't have the challenges. Everyone can have that type of access. You still need a leader, but for different reasons. Whereas it came to Balaam and Balak and, and Bilam, here was you're dealing with a deviousness, a, a wizardry, you know, a sorcery. So this refers in our own lives that we all have that part that is very the dark, the dark side. 
the scouts and with Korach, you don't talk about a dark side. You talk about mistakes. In a way, it's much subtler, their mistakes, but it still comes down to they didn't have a God or they forgot about God for a moment and therefore they made their grave mistake. Here, you're talking about a whole different picture here. And it gets much more complicated because you see Bilam actually invokes the name of God. He says, I can't do anything without God. And you read the story, it sounds almost odd. Because on one hand, God tells him not to go. But he still keeps insisting and finding excuses to go. Then he sends the angel to block his way. So he should have understood to go back. So clearly you see that Bilam is manipulating here. He knows he can't get God to say, he can't say anything he wants to say. But he's clearly trying to set up a situation where God will give him the ability to curse them. So because if he was just suddenly so, so obedient, he would have just stayed, stayed put. So clearly he's not that obedient. At the end of the day, he couldn't say what he wants. He couldn't say what God didn't tell him to say. But everything else, he was trying to maneuver. In our lives, it's when we start using our devious side to start making deals. And sometimes we even use God in the picture as well. When the bottom line is driven by a whole dark side. This is the dark side. So, you know, we talked about, I mentioned Hitler. The same thing in history. You have people that, where, they, where it moves over to a whole different dimension. So though I made a common denominator between the leaders, obviously Bilam goes into a whole different category. And in many ways he was much more powerful than Korach and the scouts. Because he was a true prophet. He had the power to bless and to curse. That's why he, uh, ultimately his blessings have so much potency. And he was a true sorcerer. And he was a man of God in a, in a very high way. As I said, he was on the level of a Moses. Not as high levels, but among the non-Jews he was the level of Moses. So the question is, what is the force of this uh, Bilam? So we have an expression in the book of Ecclesiastes, we have Kehelis, it says, osa lekim. That God created a parallel universe. For everything that he created in holiness, he created something in, in the unholy, in the profane. In a way, it's to keep the balance and to give us the ability to have free will. I remember... <coughs> In 1980, it was a connection to children. It was before the summer camps. So I remember the Rebbe gave a talk, which really can be a lesson in any sport. He used soccer, you know, even though soccer is not an American sport, because I guess it's not so conducive to the advertisements and the low scoring and a lot of other factors that are not that commercial. Um, but they're trying to make it a big thing here, too. But every game, every, every, every game has uh, two teams. And so remember, he used the analogy of soccer, what we call Kaduregel. We call football football, but in other countries, football is soccer. It makes more sense. They, they, they play only with the feet. But, uh, um, so the game of soccer, which is some consider to be the purest uh, two-team sport, because it's just purely using your body without any instruments and so on. And um, so you have two teams. One, and each of them's goal is to try to hit the ball into the other opponent's goal. So I remember they gave this analogy that the ball refers to the world, the universe is a globe. And uh, we each, in this world we have two forces. There's the, for everything there is in holiness you have the opposite. And each of them have the same amount of people on each team. So for every power, for every, for every blessing we're given, we're also given a challenge that's equally powerful. And then we have the power to, to choose and the power to who will prevail. You know, similarly, the game of chess can be seen as that. So in a way, the Bilam story is very much the antithesis of the Moses story. So just like there's a Moses, a prophet in Israel, a holy prophet, a, a tzaddik like Moses. So to counter the balance in this world is the parallel universe. There's also the other force. There's Bilam. So this is a whole different dimension. We don't talk about Korach and the scouts quite like that. So Bilam is actually the alter ego of Moses. In our own personal lives, as I mentioned earlier, the greater you are, the greater the Yetzirah. So we also have a Moses within us, and we have a Bilam within us. The Bilam within us is also a godly force. Cannot do something that God doesn't allow it, but... The Bilam within us looks for all kinds of devious methods to get God to do what you want to do instead of what God wants. And, uh, 
And ultimately the story is this, that when you learn to transform it properly, you can transform even the Bilam and his intention to curse into great blessings, blessings that are even greater than the blessings that come from Moses. Because Moses was initially a tzaddik. Bilam, in a sense, is like the a concept of a balchuva, the concept of someone who transforms darkness into light. So what does it mean in practical terms? So let me just use, uh, uh, I guess, a blunt example from the Talmud. It's not my example, it's from the Talmud. The Talmud tells a story about a sage who fell from grace and uh, went to visit a prostitute. The Talmud tells us, Talmud does not mince words when it comes to stuff like this. And, um, and of course afterwards, he has deep regrets, but he did what he did. Then the Talmud continues to say that because the prostitute had met him, so she had an awakening herself. And she decided to change her ways. And she became a, a righteous woman. She ends up marrying this sage. That's the end of the story. I mean, obviously, it's a long journey. And the Talmud puts it in this, this type of expression. As I said, it's very graphic, but there we're all adults here. So I think I could put it to the, the, the Talmud says, The pillows that she offered him in sin, she later offered him in mitzvah, which is essentially she transformed herself, and obviously he, he transformed himself. And they became husband and wife. So this is used as an example of obviously transformation. Now, in the Talmudic story, it's a very graphic story in the sense sexual prostitution, something graphic, it doesn't go into details, but it brings it out in a very extreme way. We each have two sides to us. You know, there's no person on earth that has not sinned. There's no person on earth that does not have some darker side. And it's one thing to talk about our uh, bright side, about our divine side and our good part. But there's also another part within us. So it's true in Judaism, the good within us is always more powerful than the bad. That even when a person makes a mistake and transgresses, it never contaminates the essence of your soul. So yes, tshuva is required. A person has to repent, has to regret, has to work on changing their negative past. But... But ultimately, the goodness within us, as I've often talked about, the yid is more powerful than the id. Let's put it this way. It's deeper. It's who we are essentially. But in Judaism, there's also the concept of transformation. That it is not just enough to leave a dark past behind. Not just enough to, to uh, ignore it. But there's something about transforming it. So in the context of psychological terms, you'll see, for example, people who've gone through difficult situations who have suffered, who have been abused. When they grow through it and heal through it, they have a power to help others in that area that others who have never experienced it cannot help them. Number one, they have credibility. Number two, they understand the sensitivities that are required. And you have this actual idea, this concept that, and I use it very often, people who have one of the best ways to redeem a difficult past is to help other people who has similar past. Because it's, then you're using strings that came specifically from your de negative experience and you're turning those pillows into good pillows, so to speak. So in the case of the Talmud, obviously I'm not talking this is a similar, it's a different situation. In the case of the Talmud, there was you know, crimes or transgressions intentionally done. What I'm describing here is really things that were done to us. You know, if you grew up in a home that was an abusive home or in any other dysfunctional way, and you learn to grow through it, you, know, you didn't do anything wrong. But you redeem it in a similar context that the things that you learn from your past experience teaches you something that you can help others in ways that only you are uniquely equipped to do. So in Judaism, there's a great concept of redemption of, of the negative. The transformation we call ishabcha, chashech al to transform darkness into light. Now the Talmudic story is obviously in a very extreme way. But even in a subtle way, we all have this. You know, I remember when I was a kid, everyone got their things, their little mushagasin. So I had my own things. I'm not going to go into a full confession here, but uh, I know you're intrigued. Um, 
But no, and I'm, not, I'm not even referring to something very, uh, very dark. But when I, uh, over the years, when I go back to that place and I learned how to use it to help others, it's a tremendous redemption. Because remember, those things shaped you. There's no way to change that. The past will never disappear. So you have two options. Either it's going to haunt you, really three options. Either it will haunt you, or you'll try to bury it, or you transform it. Which, of course, is the greatest option, because then you're tapping its energy and, and channeling it into something positive. And most people, most obviously, would like to bury anything that's dark in the past. Usually you can't really bury it, because somewhere it's going to pop up, even if you don't like, to, like it to pop up. So the healthiest thing is to learn to transform it. So that story in the Talmud, when you think about it, is a tremendous story. It doesn't really discuss, I mean, I have to research, I don't recall right now, her history, how did she become a prostitute, etc. But the bottom line is, it is a story of tremendous redemption. And it's not like she was lost, and it's all damaged, and so on. There is an ability to transform and to learn from things that she had learned through her own experiences, she trans translated them and transformed them into positive things. Now, none of us should have to go through something of that extreme, but in a subtle form, this is the story with, uh, with uh, Bilam. So we all have strengths, powerful strengths, that may have been abused either by others or by ourselves, used the wrong way. And you really have that option. You know, as I said, it's very smart people, very shrewd people, people who have, uh, uh, who have a certain depth, and whatever strength and different strengths that each of us has, we all know you can use it sometimes in very bad ways. Because if you're a step ahead of others, you can manipulate them, you can maneuver, you know, sometimes you, you make minimum, minimum, or you can use it to be a step of, ahead of others in helping them, to think for two people in a way. So every, everything that we have in our power is neutral. It doesn't have to be used for negative, it to, but, it, but it, sometimes it is. So the story with Bilam is an essentially, in this so-called triad of three levels of corruption, is a whole different level than the first two. So the first two deal more with ascetic life versus immersion, uh, Korach is the opposite extreme and how they distort and get corrupted as a result. Here we're talking now about the darker side of life. And the darker side of life, Bilam represents that within each of us. We all have that Bilam within us. But we also have the Moses within us. So in answering the big question of all, so when there's corruption atop, can you really fight City Hall? You know? So in Judaism there's the concept of microcosm, macrocosm. Can we right here, a few humble people like us in this room, or even if you add and multiply and say thousands of people, can we really change uh, the reality of what's going on in Washington or in other, the halls of power? As I said, can you fight City Hall? Can you change City Hall? So of course we can elect officials, but then you start wondering whether you elect one official, how, how much, you know, is it really that one is completely corrupt and the other one's completely pure? I mean, I think even naive people know that it's not exactly that way. Um, you know, everybody's got their strengths and their weaknesses. But there's an interesting concept in Judaism which is called microcosm and macrocosm. Everything in the larger world exists in the smaller world, within ourselves. Each of us is a small universe. And the universe is a large organism, a large human being. So though we may not be able to have direct impact, except, as I said, through elections and other ways, some of us may be activists, but we can have impact on ourselves and our immediate surroundings. Remember, corruption exists in this world not because there are free corrupt people. All of us are potentially corrupt. So where does this begin to be reversed? Does it begin from the top or does it begin from the bottom? When you look at some of the great people in history that I mentioned, you know, Jacob who was humbled by the, the chassadim, the humble people, what they always looked at was themselves. They were not busy trying to fix governments. They were not trying to fix other people's problems. They created a model within their own lives that was incorruptible. And they believed firmly that if you do it in your personal life, it spills over into your family, and from your family to your community, and from your community to the larger world. So six billion, six billion plus people on this earth are six billion individuals like us. So who exactly, where exactly is lack of corruption going to begin? So we don't have to look at everybody else. You know, it's that classic argument why television is such a low standard today. 
So the television producers say it's because the, that's what the people want. The advertisers say that's what, the, that's what people are paying for. The people say, like us, say it's the producers are that are, are so decadent and so, uh, you know, uh, perverse. We all know we're all in the same boat. It's all of us. It's the blind leading the blind. We feed each other. And the way it goes in a vicious cycle of, of, of low common denominators, it keeps on decelerating until the point we all point fingers at each other. The Jews always knew one thing, the, the great leaders. The buck stops here. You are responsible for your life starting from there. You know that classic story where the guy says he started his life ready to change the world. You know, after 40 years in his life, he came to discover he'll change his city. Then he decided he'll change his block. Then he'll change his family. And then by the time he's 80, he realized the only thing he has left is to change himself. Now, had he known that 80 years ago, that would have been nice. You know, so I'm not suggesting any of us have public power and not to use it for the good. Obviously, if you're in a position like that, you have the story of Mordechai, others who are in a position, you have connections. But remember, even your connections, it begins with yourself. And you never say, just because everybody else is, not, is doing it, everybody else is corrupt, that's why I'll also be corrupt. That is the classic line, a cop out of a victim. Abraham didn't say it, and Jacob didn't say it, and none of these greats say it. That's why they, they lived on, they live on. You know that story where uh, they prepare, a small town gets news that a great king is coming to visit them. But they're very poor, so they have nothing really a gift to give to this king. It's like once in a lifetime. So they prepare a big barrel in the big middle of town. They came up with an idea. Everyone's going to, you know, everyone can do a little contribution. Everyone's going to pour a bottle of wine into the barrel. They'll give the king the wine, the barrel of wine, so the king will understand for a poor city like this. It's a big effort. Now, of course, there's a smart, smart little Jews in this town. So the first two smart guy said, hey, you know what? Everybody else is pouring wine. Why should I spend such expensive wine when we barely, you know, I'll pour a bottle of water. Now, of course, everybody else in the, in the town was just as smart as him. So you know what the king ended up getting? A barrel of water, you know, because everybody did the same. Like the two rowing teams, the Jewish rowing team you know, that keeps losing the races. So they said, we've got to figure out how these non-Jews keep winning. So they send them to one of these Ivy League schools, go figure out the rowing team. So the Jew comes back and says, it's very simple. There they have nine guys rowing and one guy yelling, you know. <laughs> By the Jews, it's nine guys yelling and one guy rowing. <laughs> so, right, classic. <laughs> um, so, what we know is like this: the, the book stops here. We start from ourselves. You know, we each have the bilum within us. We each have the corruptible about elements. In your own personal life, where there's no dramatics and no no television cameras and no cameras at all, no one's watching. The choices you make are seen above. And they have an effect, a ripple effect on this world. It will be when individuals like us make a decision that no matter what I see around me, and no matter what I see everybody else is um, doing something that is inappropriate, when I will stop the tide here, you know, stem the, they call it stem the tide, um, stop the bleeding here, that's when the world changes. And there were individuals in history that knew that. And was, as I said, without fireworks, it was very humble, small little moments in the world. You know, we live in a time where we love things that are dramatic. Everybody sees it. You have heroes and stuff like that. Hey, listen, nothing not wrong with honoring someone that's a hero. But the greatest acts of heroics that change lives, you know where they happen? They happen when nobody's watching. You tell me, is there something more life-changing than when a mother in the early stages of her child's, birth, uh, child's development, speaks to that child, sings to the child, hugs the child. Tell me what, what in life is more powerful and shapes a life more than that. And everything, everyone takes that for granted. You have no cameras, you have no television crews, there's no television shows, but there's not even a reality show about it yet. I'm sure someone will come up with that too if, it, if they can get some advertising dollars. But you get what I'm saying. And this happens... I don't know how many times it happens. You know, unfortunately, this week I met a, a clinical psychologist. Not, it's not unfortunate that I met the clinical psychologist. It's unfortunate what I heard from her. So she told me that, I mean, it didn't shock me, but it shocked me nevertheless because of the numbers, that 95% of homes in America are considered dysfunctional. 
And when I asked, and I said, what is dysfunctional? Dysfunctional means a, uh, an alcoholic or other type of force in the family and home that is, disrupts the natural nurturing of a family. That's, it doesn't mean per se necessarily divorce or per se some type of uh, trauma, but a type of disruption of the normal flow of nurturing. I was thinking 95%, that's unbelievable. 5% of people have a fighting chance. The 95% also have a chance, as I said, there's time to transform, but it's an uphill battle. It's tremendous. And you start thinking about, you know, our society, our society, and I'm not from the doomsayers that like to talk about the negative, but it's just complete off foc completely off, uh, you know, the focus is in the wrong place. I mentioned this many times, I ask sociologists, I know, you know, how do you measure the standard, the welfare of a uh, successful society. So across, the bo across the board, check it out on Google, they'll always answer the same thing. Standard of living, uh, per capita economic uh, health insurance, medical um, longevity, now, all b great things, don't get me wrong. Technology, which of course turns third world countries into uh, into lower standards, they're not socially as evolved. So in general is the myth somewhat of the Western world that it sees itself superior because of its technologies. And therefore those that didn't develop those technologies are clearly inferior. Won't go into a debate about that. And then I look to the Torah, and I always say this to the person who people I ask this to, I said, what does the Torah say? How does the Torah measure a successful society? And it's interesting, if you want to measure a successful society, what better place to go to than the Torah? It's only Jewish people are the only ones that survived uh, God Almighty for 3,000 years. So you want to know a successful society, look at the Jews. I'm not saying we are individually, and every group of us is, not, is, is, is healthy, but collectively, which society has survived? And the answer is very simple. Anyone that knows, you don't need to know, you don't need to be a Torah scholar to know. It's all about the children. It's all about the family unit. Everything around Judaism. Seder table. Tell your children when they will ask you. Educate them. We say it in Shema how many times a day. Educate your children. Make sure from the youngest age. Uh, mothers, grandmothers. From back on thousands of years knew that in a crib when a baby is born, surround the child with holiness. That's why we have the holy words. You know, certain things are done in the earliest stages of life. I had concepts that are just beginning to penetrate child psychology, Jews knew thousands of years ago, that what you do in early stages shape a child forever. And those little acts, which are not so dramatic, you know, we live in a society where children are really adults in the making. You want them to start making their money. In all the investment that we make, adults make in their children, we want to raise, they should start returning the investment. Because that's how we think. Economics, money. But the concept of shaping a child, and that's the focus, is even though people wax eloquent and with platitudes about it, and you'll hear, but the fact is, our society is not structured that way. It's just not structured. It's a society structured around material success, around security around material, in the name of uh, providing security for our children. It's not structured as the number one focus is the welfare of our children and our families. So, if you talk about rever reversing the uh, corruption, forces of corruption, it doesn't begin with just demanding that people have checks and balances. The fact is people are going to cheat as long as they don't get caught, because they don't have any standards that are higher. Why, why would they? But you start teaching children from young age integrity, and you yourself who teaches them has that integrity. That's what changes the world. That's the bottom line. So it's, uh, yes, it is a very, very almost like an intimate, private battle, because you don't have many allies. You can't like make a whole group of people, let's just reverse this, because the society f fights tooth and nail against what I've just said. No one will make a claim that it fights tooth and nail, but society's structure, its standards, its values are completely not focused around this. So to go back to the Billam story, the Billam story comes down to the, you reverse the process by recognizing where to put your strengths and start fighting in your, the battle in your own little turf, in our own selves. We each have our, as I said, corruptible elements. Not only do we conquer them, we can transform them. The story of transformation from curse to blessing. That's the end of the story. The end of the story is the curse to blessing. 
Now, of course, there's the other end that I mentioned that is also a humble reminder that our, we are our own worst enemy. And that's what ultimately Balaam understood. He couldn't curse them. So he understood the way to do it is to weaken them, weaken their resolve. Which is also countered by what I just said. The battles that we choose to fight in our own personal lives. You know, um, and never underestimate that type of subtle effect that you have on yourself or others when you make, that, when you make those little moves. I, um, I, I remember the story I've told since this weekend, just for the record, I'm announcing this as well. I'm going to be in East Hampton. There's a Shabbaton weekend retreat. If anybody wants to is around in that area, you're welcome to come. I'll be there Friday night, Sat Shabbos, all the way through Sun Sunday morning. There'll be a whole event there as well. Um, so years ago, last time I did a Shabbaton in East Hampton, I was driving there on Friday, and I stopped for uh, to refill my car, and uh, somewhere in the highway, somewhere off the highway, on the 27 already, and I um, uh, there was a an attendant there parking cars, and um, he came over to me, asked me if I'm staying for the party tonight, because they were right near the gas station. There was this club. So I said, not this party, I'm going to another party further east. And uh, we started talking. He was asking me, very curious about what I do, who I was. I wasn't sure why. But uh, anyway, I told him, I write, I teach. And at the time, he said to me, so you, what you write, you send it out? So I said, yeah, we send out a weekly email. So he asked me to put him on the email list, and I did. I took his name, and I remember the story, and that was it. I registered it. I, came, I went to East time, I came back home. Uh, years later, it took him now around five years, five, this happened maybe seven years ago. So something like a f three years ago, a few years later, I get an email from him one day. And he writes to me, you probably don't remember me, I was that parking attendant. You know, he looked like some redneck kid from I don't know where. Um, and he said, you probably don't remember, you probably don't know that I was Jewish, but I was, I'm Jewish. Grew up in a home that, uh, you know, I left my home and I had no Jewish education. And since you've been sending the emails, I've learned a lot about Judaism. And this has become my whole connection. He started telling me that he prays with it at Yom Kippur and Rosh Hashanah. And I saw from what he's writing that he was following, he really was learning. He and I couldn't believe it that, you know, based on hundreds of emails, he learned a lot about Judaism. This was, and he was waiting. He said, I wait every Thursday night for your email. And I would never have believed a small little gesture like that. After that, I made it the holy grail. Wherever I go, I just get everybody's email addresses because it seems so simple. An email address. You know, once upon a time ago, you'd have to mail a package. Who says the guy's going to get it? Not get it. Here, it's like press of a button. So besides the power of technology, the power of touching someone. All of us have that ability. We all have our sphere of influence. And then we have our spheres that are not necessarily influenced, but places you're going to travel to. You're on a bus, you're on a subway, you're on a plane. You know, if you see your life as a mission, that you're here to touch someone, to make a connection, everything changes. Because there's a difference between being a taker or a giver. The difference between someone that is just passively waiting for something to happen or making things happen. And you can always make things happen. Because you could always strike up a conversation, say something, share a good word, a thought. People... You know, I'm not talking about doing it in a corny way. There's ways to do it, if you're, intelligent ways to strike up a conversation. Start talking about something that matters. People always respond. Of course, once in a while you may find a person who doesn't. But even then, you never know a kind word, what it does to, to even soften a sour uh, or, or a heart of stone. So we have this power. And this is where it all plays itself out. And those little acts, those little drops of water is what counters the a darkness of a, of a bilam. And to the point where you can actually transform even a, a curse into a blessing. So when we begin doing these little steps, we begin strengthening the Moses within. And uh, slowly, slowly, accumulatively, especially when we take into account that our ancestors have been doing this for thousands of years, so we're not asked to do something like change the whole world. There's an accumulative power and synergy that is accumulated over the generations, over the centuries. And it's all there waiting to erupt. So it could just be that one last drop, that one last step that we have to do in this long marathon that 
um, tips the scales. As Maimonides says, that a person should always look at the world as equally balanced. 50% negative, 50% positive. So you have a scale that's equal. And one positive thing tips the scale. So there's a Bilam and there's a Moses. But there's a count, they, count, they, count, they cancel each other out. It's your one act that makes the difference. When you think like that, it's a whole different way of looking at things. It's a look, way of looking that there's a uh, bigger picture. We may not see it. And one act is not just an act. That one act is the difference between uh, life and death. Between uh, redemption and... Uh, and uh, was the, and, and was the opposite of redemption, bondage, slavery, damnation. damnation. That's strong stuff. Yeah. So, what more can I say, my friends? Uh, except that each of us, the balls in your court, in our court, and, uh, and I come here every week, trying to tip the scale a bit. And uh, if, if every one of us did a bit of bit, did our part, both here. You know, now we have also the internet, so this global uh, webcast, this global streaming and archiving, just like the email, you never know who you're going to reach. That's the beauty today. You put something out there on Facebook, on uh, some of the other networks, you never know, you say the right word. I see a lot of people posting stuff, uh, yeah, nice, nice cute stuff about their own personal lives and stuff, but maybe once in a while post something that has some meaning, a meaningful experience. And you never know, people respond. You keep, we keep doing this in a, consi in a persistent, consistent way. It has its impact. So with that being said, I want to wish everyone a very uh, healthy summer. And uh, we will be, I'll be back next week, Wednesday. I'm glad we have the emails going out. So last week I ended up going to South Africa. It was a last minute thing to a wedding of my nephew. And sorry about that. I don't like to disrupt the class. But if you don't have your email address, please leave it because that can be the difference between coming here and no one here. Even though I plan to be, I think, throughout the summer, but some things always sometimes change. So we thank God we have this networking. And tomorrow night, Philip will be giving his class 7 p.m., Philip Namaworth. If anybody wants information on that, you just call our office. We will help you connect with him. And again, thank you, Mark, for dedicating the class in honor of Sarah Bat Moshe, 10th of Tammuz, your grandmother's yard site. And uh, if anybody wants to dedicate a class, either those here or anyone online, please uh, contact us. Belville just made a grand appearance. So, oh, yeah? So we have the first feedback, says so that's excellent. Um, should, we should have a rating thing for uh, the class, you know? And we just don't, uh, you know, don't publicize the ones that say it wasn't good. Just say that. So everyone have a very, very good night and uh, keep cool. This in the what do we call it? The the sultry heat of New York summers. Um, so good night everybody. Simon Jacobs. Good to see you.